Welcome to the fourth module in this introductory session on FMCW radars. Hopefully, the first three modules have given you a good understanding of uh, range and velocity estimation in the radar. This module is going to uh, sort of uh, uh, try and tie all of that information together. Uh, first, we'll take a step back and review the signal processing flow for range and velocity estimation. Then we'll try and design a transmit signal which meets certain uh, specified requirements in terms of range resolution, uh, maximum range, velocity resolution, maximum velocity. And we'll uh, get a feel for some of the trade-offs involved in doing that. Finally, we'll look at what is often called uh, as the radar range equation, which is kind of a link budget for radar and relates parameters such as the output power and the antenna gain to the maximum distance that the radar can see. I think we've progressed a lot so far. So we know that objects at different ranges can be resolved using a range FFT. And then Doppler FFT is done across subsequent chirps in a frame resolves objects which may be at the same range but have uh, different velocities with respect to the radar. So this slide is a summary of uh, um, everything that we've uh, learned so far. So here you have a frame uh, multiple chirps transmitted in a frame. The ADC samples corresponding to each of these chirps can be visualized as stored as being stored um, as the rows of the ma of a matrix. So each row here corresponding to samples from a specific chirp. Uh, an FFT called a range FFT is then performed on each row and this range FFT resolves objects in range. So here you have the results of the range FFT and uh, you can see here that this third range bin and this range bin over here, uh, both of these uh, range bins have uh, objects in them. Um, note that the x-axis is actually the frequency corresponding to the range FFT bins, but since range is proportional to the IF frequency, I can equivalently plot this um, axis as the range axis. So subsequently, an FFT called the Doppler FFT is performed along the columns uh, of this uh, range FFT results, and this resolves objects in the velocity dimension. Um, so here are the results of the Doppler FFT and uh, you can see that the uh, third range bin has um, two objects at different velocities and likewise this range bin has uh, three objects at uh, um, different velocities. Um, again here um, this y axis uh, is actually the Doppler uh, is actually the um, uh, discrete angular frequencies corresponding to the Doppler FFT. But since those uh, discrete angular frequencies are proportional to the velocity, uh, I can equivalently plot this uh, axis as a velocity axis. So this whole pro process of taking the range FFT uh, followed by the Doppler FFT is uh, together called the 2D FFT or two-dimensional FFT. And you'll hear that term a lot in uh, um, FMCW radar literature. Uh, so one thing to note is that in most implementations of FMCW radar, uh, the range FFT is usually done in line uh, as the ADC data for each chirp becomes available. Uh, so you can think of the ADC data uh, for each chirp as being received at a DSP. The DSP then performs the range FFT and then uh, stores the range FFT in uh, some memory. So it could be L3 memory or DDR. Uh, you know, depending on the uh, uh, system. Uh, the other thing to note is that the Doppler FFT can only be performed once all the range FFTs have become available. That is once all these rows are populated. So uh, there should be sufficient memory in the system to store uh, the contents uh, of all the range FFTs corresponding to a frame. So um, these here are a bunch of formulas that we've learned so far. Uh, the maximum unambiguously measurable velocity um, inversely proportional to the uh, time duration between adjacent chirps. The velocity resolution inversely proportional to the uh, total frame time. Um, and from the previous module, we know that the range resolution is inversely proportional to the uh, total bandwidth spanned by the uh, chirp uh, 
and the IF bandwidth required um, is proportional to the product of the slope and the maximum range that we wish the radar to see. Um, so I think we are now ready to try and design an FMCW signal that meets certain end user requirements. So let's say we are given specifications for a range resolution, a maximum range, a velocity resolution, and a maximum velocity. How do we you know, use these specifications to design a frame? Let's, let's sketch one possible design method. Let's start with the um, VMAX requirement. Note that VMAX depends only on TC. So given VMAX, um, we can directly calculate the interchirp time TC and we go ahead and put that in our frame. Next note that the range resolution depends only on the chirp bandwidth. So this gives us the bandwidth B. And we now go and modify the chirps in our frame to reflect this bandwidth. Note that since we've already decided the chirp duration and the bandwidth, this means that we've already locked in the slope S of the chirp. Next, the frame duration only depends on the velocity resolution. So this allows us to compute the required frame time TF. So we go in and fill in the required number of chirps, spaced TC apart to fill in the um, time duration of TF. So basically that completes our definition of the entire frame. Note that we've still not used this equation here. So the assumption is that the radar device will support the necessary IF bandwidth determined by this equation. In practice, the process of arriving at chirp parameters might be more iterative than we've indicated because of various device constraints that we did not address in the previous slide. For example, the maximum required IF bandwidth uh, might not be supported by the device. Uh, note that the maximum IF bandwidth is proportional to the product of the slope and the desired maximum distance and hence a trade-off between the slope and the maximum distance um, might be needed. Next, the device must be able to generate the required slope. Each device typically has a limit on the maximum slope of the chirp that the synthesizer can generate. Uh, there might also be device specific requirements for the idle time between adjacent chirps and this needs to be honored. Lastly, the device must have sufficient memory to store the range FFT data for all the chirps in the frame. Note that the range FFT data for all the chirps has to be stored uh, prior to Doppler FFT computation. This slide just elaborates on the inherent trade-off between slope and the maximum distance Dmax that we alluded to earlier. The product of the slope and Dmax is limited by the available IF bandwidth in the device. Hence, as Dmax increases, the slope S has to be decreased. Assuming that the duration of the chirp TC is frozen based on the maximum velocity requirement, a smaller slope directly translates to a poorer resolution. And that is illustrated here, uh, where a smaller slope means that you span a lesser bandwidth in the same amount of time and hence a poorer resolution. Remember in module one, we saw how the maximum ADC sampling rate limited the maximum distance that the radar could see. There is another important factor which determines the maximum distance. And that is simply that the signal reflected from this maximum distance object should be of sufficient strength to be detectable at the radar. So let's figure out what factors this received signal strength depends on. Um, so here you have a radar uh, device which is outputting a power of say PT watts. This power emanates from the transmit antenna and uh, since the signal is spreading out, its power density falls off as the square of the distance. Uh, so this is the expression for the radiated power density. Uh, this uh, power density can be increased by employing an antenna with better gain. And the way this usually works is that the antenna improves its gain by increasing its directivity. That is by concentrating the output power from the device over a narrower field of view as shown here. So we incorporate the antenna gain GTX uh, into this expression. Now the power reflected by the target, um, which is at a distance D, 
is given by this expression which is uh, basically this variated power density multiplied by this uh, by sigma where sigma denotes the radar cross section of the target um, also known as the rcs now the rcs is basically a measure of the target's ability to reflect radar signals in the direction of the radar receiver so the power reflected back um, by the target again um, decays as the square of the density uh, square of the distance so the power density at the receive antenna is now going to be given by this expression which is the same as this with an additional factor of 4 pi d square incorporated to account for the um, decay on the return path signal decay on the return path now the power captured at the receive antenna is going to be given by this expression again the same as this with an additional factor here uh, which is the effective aperture area of the receive antenna and uh, this is a measure of the receive antenna's capability to capture uh, uh, as much of the received signal as possible now it turns out that this um, effective aperture um, um, can be written in terms of the gain of the receive antenna and the operating wavelength um, using this expression so you know substituting this expression over here we finally get this expression for the power capture of the receive antenna uh, which as you can see is proportional to the transmitted power and the um, gain of the transmitted and receive antennas proportional to the um, rcs of the target and inversely proportional to the fourth power of the distance to the target whether or not a receiver can see a target depends not just on the uh, power of the received signal but on the ratio of the signal energy to the noise energy in other words uh, the signal to noise ratio or snr now this is the equation for the snr which i am going to flash here without proof uh, but uh, we already got an intuitive feel for the received signal power in the uh, previous discussion and you can see a lot of those terms uh, you know mirrored here um, so the snr is proportional to the transmitted power from the device the gain of the transmit and receive antennas the rcs of the device um, is inversely proportional to the fourth power of distance uh, you know and all this and all this follows from you know what we saw in the last slide um, this here is a term that is related to the noise introduced at the receiver uh, it's called the antenna noise um, and uh, has to do with the physics of the antenna this is the um, noise figure of the receiver which represents the additional noise noise introduced internal to the radar device and uh, this here is interesting is the total measurement time so for an fmcw uh, radar uh, a frame of an fmcw radar which has n chirps um, each of duration tc this measurement time would be n times tc now let's talk about this factor for a moment here so what this says is that the snr improves as the measurement time increases and uh, the reason for this is the following as the measurement time increases we of course get to observe both the signal which is what we want and the noise which is what we do not want for a longer period but the key point to note is that the signal is deterministic while the noise is random so um, as the input signal goes through the radar processing chain um, consisting of the range FFT followed by the Doppler FFT, the portion due to the useful signal is accumulated coherently, while the noise sort of tends to get gets uh, sort of tends to get uh, averaged out. Uh, this is also referred to as uh, processing gain and um, is basically represented by this uh, uh, factor over here. Now uh, there is a minimum SNR that is required for detecting an object. Um, you know, I'm referring to I'm referring to that here as SNR min, um, and this means that any target which is detected in the range velocity plot with an SNR less than this, um, you know, uh, minimum um, SNR is not considered as a valid target. Now this SNR min is usually a system designer choice and is a trade-off between the probability of missed detection. And probability of false alarms. So, um, if you choose a high value for SNR min, um, you will have a very low probability of false alarm, but you might also probably miss a few valid detections. Um, anyway, once the choice of SNR min has been made, the maximum distance that the radar can see 
can be computed as follows, which basically follows from this expression, you know, uh, with, from this equation with a little bit of rearrangement. Uh, so most of these parameters here, such as the antenna gain and the output power of the device are dependent on the hardware. But uh, note that the measurement time here is something that can be incorporated while designing the transmit signal. This completes the third module. Over the past three modules, we've had quite an in-depth look at range and um, velocity estimation in an FMCW radar. So we learned that if there are two objects uh, equidistant from the radar, but uh, with different velocities related to the radar, these objects will show up as a single peak in the range FFT, but will be separated out by the Doppler FFT. Thus, uh, they will show up as uh, two peaks in the 2D FFT plot or the range velocity plot. But what if there are two objects equidistant from the radar and having the same velocity relative to the radar? How will the range velocity plot look like? Well, the range velocity plot resulting from the 2D FFT will have a single peak since both these objects have the same range and velocity relative to the radar. How then do we separate these two objects? It turns out that for that, you will need multiple antennas uh, to be able to uh, estimate the angles of arrival of these objects. And this is something that is discussed in the next module.